We had a really great year last year with our first ever tra first ever run of Neo Hacks. We had 381 hackers from 26 different countries, and most of our hackers were beginners who hadn't touched a line of code in their lives, which was incredibly insane. And we had a total of 37 projects submitted, with most of those hackers being beginners. So we're very very proud of our hackers from last year and we're very excited to see what you guys have in store for us this year um so unfortunately i can't share my slides because i am in a little bit of a um location where i can't do that um so we're just gonna have to go with what we have um and we'll have everything posted in the discord all the information there as well so no need to worry about that and we'll all the entire team will be available to answer any questions you have in the discord um, so as for our schedule, we have this posted in the Discord as well as all the um, assigned Zoom links for each um, workshop and each event um, scheduled already in the Discord calendar, which is a very cool um, feature. And it will be in the top left corner. You'll see um, right under it says Neo Hacks 2.0. Right. As like, sorry, I think someone said something. Can everyone, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, perfect. Um, okay. Sorry about this once again. It's a little bit of a typical situation, um, but yeah. Okay, so for looking at the schedule, they're all scheduled in Discord in the events calendar once again, which is right under um, the title of the Discord, which is NeoHex 2.0. And you'll see right under that a little calendar emoji that says I think 15 events. Um, so if you click on that, you'll have all the Zoom links for every single workshop or event we have, as well as their time in your time zone, which is a really, really handy feature. Um, we'll also be notifying you guys in our announcement channel um, like 15 minutes before each workshop and each event so you'll have all that information as well but as a quick overview for today our our opening ceremony is right now and we have team formation going on until about 2 30 2 40 ish when we start our first workshops and our workshops go from about 2 40 to 10 10 tonight and we have six workshops for you guys to enjoy today. So we're very excited for that. Um, and then tomorrow's more of a fun, chill day where you guys are just working on your projects. You need a little time to get away from your projects and just be stressed, maybe meet some new people. We have a bunch of really cool games planned. And then projects or submissions close at 7 p.m. And we have our closing ceremony at 8.30 p.m. So next, moving on to team formation. Uh, we did send out a form, which I think we'll send out again, once again, in the Discord, if you haven't seen that, um, where you apply as a, a team, if you already have a team, or if you would like to be randomly assigned as a team. There's also a team formation channel, which you can message in and try to find a team there. And once you do have a team, we will be creating your own team channels where you can discuss with your team and um, come up with your project. And so next, we wanted to, we were very, very excited to have Raymond Yan, who's a Senior Executive Vice President of DigiPen Institute of Technology as our keynote speaker today. And he'll be speaking for a little bit and have a little bit of a Q&A session right afterwards. Um, so Mr. Raymond Yan, thank you so much for being here and you can go ahead and get started. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. My name is Raymond, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm working. I've been working with a, a private college in Seattle called DigiPen Institute of Technology. Uh, I've been associated with DigiPen for over 30 years, and I've also been involved with game development for over 30 years. Um, you may have heard of a company called Nintendo, and I had the fortune to, uh, while I was working for DigiPen, I also had a second job, a full-time job where I was the head of art and design at Nintendo Software Technology. Uh, Nintendo Software Technology was the first development team, uh, the first Nintendo development team outside of Japan. And so um, this is going back to like almost basically around the year 2000. That tells you how long I've been doing this. And uh, in fact, one of the games that I worked on was called Pokemon Puzzle League. It was for the N64. And that game was just re released on the Nintendo Switch as part of the N64 kind of pack. So uh, if you kind of want to see something that I worked on, uh, that was a, it's a great puzzle game. And I encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm really... Uh, Honored to, to be here today. Um, you know, I, I really love hackathons. I think it's a it's a great way for new people to to dive into it. Maybe not necessarily new, but you know, to really get together and, and celebrate 
this this interesting uh, uh, industry, you know, that, and I've been involved with it for such a long time. You know, at the end of the day, um, all the games and, and all the productions, I mean, it sounds really awesome. But as you guys now realize, you know, as, as hack, you know, uh, in these uh, these hackathons, that making games is actually not easy, right? It's actually pretty difficult. And, and um, you know, I was asked to kind of maybe just give some, uh, maybe a couple of tips of advice as you guys uh, prepare for this competition. Um, you know, what is really awesome today when i when i think back to when i first started making games um my first game that i made actually was for the super nintendo entertainment system snes uh believe it or not it was a tic-tac-toe game and uh it was one of the first projects i did for nintendo um very very difficult to work in we had to program an assembler the graphics had to be converted we didn't have a lot of resolution we didn't have there's very very little to work with but um you know and then on top and above that, again, very, very difficult. Uh, you couldn't just sit down and, and work. We didn't have a tool like Unity. We didn't have a tool like Unreal or even Scratch. Um, it was just looking at screens filled with numbers and somehow converting our graphics to that. But, you know, today, what's really amazing is that we do have tools like Unity and Unreal and, and Game Maker. And, and the whole list. And I think what's amazing about that is that it has really democratized kind of the experience that uh, the, the opportunity for people like you to get involved without having to, you know, necessarily do, you know, eight years of computer science and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, I, I often sort of equate today and the game development um, sort of opportunities to the way that it was when the, the you know, World Wide Web, you know, when the first web pages first came out and you had to know HTML and you had to know how to convert color into hex and you had to know um, a web building site and very quickly drag and drop our pictures or videos or whatever content we want. We can integrate it with our social media uh, very, very easily, right? Or if you want to equate it to a word processor, you know, before we had to be able to, you know, carve our words into into you know stone or you even use clay tablets to try and do that and eventually even with a printing press having to put all the letters together and you know like just a tremendous amount of work just to put a word up on the page but today we can work with a word processor very quickly so again word processors sort of democratize the process for us to be able to write and what that means for you as you know game developers is that you really now have to focus on the experience you can't blame the technology that oh I can't have graphics that look you know that don't look very good or oh I don't have access to 3D software or because it's so expensive or oh I don't have a really good computer with a great graphics card. You guys have all of that today, so you can't hide behind those excuses. And I think as developers, my biggest piece of advice, you know, when you're starting out, you really have to think about what we're doing. We're here to make an experience, right? This is not a movie. This is not a book. This is not just a photograph or something. This is something that needs to be interactive. And we have to think about our audience a lot, right? We have to think about the idea that, you know, players want something new, but they don't necessarily want to read a manual. They want to see new artwork. They want to see, you know, you know really interesting gameplay. And again, that comes down to the most basic element, which is that core, core, core mechanic that you're going to incorporate into your game. So a lot of times I find in hackathons, people start out with a story, people start out, you know, they have a theme or something like that, which is fine. But if you don't have the technical capability, you know, you don't have the understanding of how to implement something, um, then in a way you're trying to cook a steak dinner, but you don't have steak, right? You've got to think about what you do have. And in this case, you have to think about, all right, I'm going to form a team the first thing you got to do is, okay, I got to get to know everybody and what can we actually do? You know, we don't have a ton of time to learn something, you know, totally new. If we're going to have to kind of base whatever product we make on what we can, um, you know, what we can do now. And it sounds really simple, but surprisingly within a lot of hackathons that I've been involved with, the, the teams don't think about that. They're just like, okay, we want to do an RPG and we want to do this, we want to do that, but they've never made an RPG before. And so the result, of course, is the, the, the very common situation where the game itself doesn't play very well. And I'm sure you guys have seen that. And maybe you've been part of that. I mean, I, I've, I've definitely been on teams where, 
you know, we, we had very high ambitions, but then we discovered that we didn't have all of the knowledge that we needed. And then the final outcome was something that wasn't very fun, right? And of course, our games today have to be much more than a sprite moving around on a screen. It has to be more than just a 3D object that can move and, and jump and, and do that. It's a game. And so I always challenge when I'm, when I'm working with new developers, I always challenge them, like, look, start with a Pong game, right? Think about what, it's, what does it mean? Think about the core mechanics. So in a Pong game, we're talking about a ball and a paddle, right? Or if it's a platform game, then it's probably a, a lot about jumping, right? Or if it's a shooter or whatever it is, you're going to have to identify that core mechanic. And I really recommend that that's what you do as you step into this, you know, this uh, game jam, right? You're really going to think about, all right, what can we do? All right, I know how to make a character move. All right, how about, can, can anyone animate that? Because everything that's in the game is ultimately feedback for the player, right? When I move my joystick to the left, then it looks like on the screen that I'm moving to the left. You know, if there's any lag time, if there's not enough feedback to the player, we're going to end up with something that players will not understand what's going on. Right. And, and maybe another example would be if we have a shooter and I have I'm, I'm trying to hit a target. I, it's got multiple hit points. Every time I hit it, I'll often as game developers, we'll make it flash. We'll make it do something so that the player has some feedback that, oh, in fact, the player, you know, the enemy got hit. So, again, my biggest piece of advice is as you guys form your teams. Right. And this is something that we do at, at Nintendo. This is something that I've always done. I look at the team and we think about what what do we know and how much time do we have to learn something new? And then from that point, we will take the idea and we'll try and understand what is the core mechanic and focus our energy to try and make sure that that mechanic is really as good as it can be. And then at some point, you know, because of your schedule, you're going to have to make a decision about, you know, is that mechanic good enough, right? Once you have that, let's say it's a character that's jumping and it's like, okay, I think this is about as good as we can make the jump. At that point, that's where you do the level design, right? Because if you imagine a character that could jump, say, 10 units, and you now start building a level based on the fact that it can jump 10 units, or you're basing a shooting game and you say, well, okay, this, this ship can fire at a certain rate and do so much damage per second, that's going to make you set the enemy to have a certain amount of hit points and, and whatnot. What you don't want to do is that you're trying to do level design and you're still tweaking your core mechanic. Because imagine now that character that you tuned your levels to be able to jump 10 units. If you now make the character jump a little bit less, all the levels that you just built are useless, right? They're broken. Or, you know, if you have a, a certain fire rate that's tuned, you know, like you're doing some kind of bullet hell type of thing and you've got all these bullets spraying out, if you tweak the damage or you tweak the fire rate, all of a sudden what you set up for the attack waves not going to work anymore, right? So I know, you know, hopefully you guys understand what I'm getting at and, you know, I'll be happy to take some questions afterwards. But the best teams I've seen in hackathons or game jams are those that really embrace that, right? We're going to make a driving game. Okay, well, then you're going to spend maybe two thirds of your time making sure that the driving experience of that car or spaceship, whatever it is, that it feels good. And a lot of people are like, yeah, but what about the levels? What about the levels? I mean, yeah, but you can't do the levels until you've got the mechanics down. Now that you've got that car and you think that's about as good as you can make it, then you lock that down and now you do the level design and the, you set the level design to challenge the way that that car is tuned. Okay. So, um, that is how I've always tackled every single one of the projects, whether I'm at Nintendo, whether I'm, you know, like I'm working in a game studio right now uh, in Saudi Arabia, of all places, believe it or not. In Saudi Arabia, they're, they're looking to build a game industry. And I have a game studio over there that are filled with young apprentices that are learning on the job how we make games. And this is the approach I teach them. So I always tell people, if you can't make a good Pong game, then don't talk to me about anything else. Right, because anything else is probably going to be more complicated, and there's too many variables to tune. It's uh, I, I think at the end of the day, if you think about all the games you've played, simple games can also be very good, right? And you can take complicated game ideas, and they can be terrible to play. So remember, what we're doing as developers, we're creating an engaging experience. Whether that's a pong game, whether it's a card game, a puzzle game, a shooter. Um, I would say that if you're new to game development 
development, I would avoid action-based games because those are very difficult to get right and start with something simple. Like I said, it could be a card game. It could be something that you're just matching cards or you're trying to get the highest value. Really, really think about the experience. Don't focus on the complexity of it. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you guys have a lot of work to do. But, um, you know, uh, perhaps there are some questions I can take. Yeah, I'm sure that was perfect. Thank you so much. I think that was some great advice just for hackathons and also just hacking in general. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions? And Mr. Grant can also answer. Someone in the chat asked. I see someone was asking asked. about the hackathon. Oh, yeah, perfect. The okay. So the theme of the hackathon, we actually don't have a theme. So it's pretty much open to whatever you want. We're really trying to target beginners in our hackathons. So we really want you guys to just try to write some lines of code, just trying to make something um, and just do whatever your heart desires. We do have um, some uh, prize categories, which you can try to aim for, um, which I can talk about if there are no more questions. Which yeah, and I apologize if I, I, I would say that everything that I've mentioned applies to any kind of software development. I mean, I've done a variety of software projects. I mean, my career has mostly been in the game industry, but I've written mobile apps for all kinds of applications. And at the heart of it, it's still what I'm talking about. You're building an application for somebody to use and you have to think about the experience for them. I mean, how many of you guys have ever used a piece of software and you didn't understand how it worked, right? And you didn't understand its purpose. You didn't understand the inputs that you have to provide. So whatever you guys are doing in your hackathon, whatever software you're going to write, you, you really want to think about the core in, in, as a game, it would be the core game mechanic. But whatever app you're doing, you have to really think, okay, what is the core purpose of this? And you got to make sure that that core aspect is actually working really well, right? Then at that point, you, you start to figure out, you know, you're, you're going to get, you're going to start running out of time. You're going to say, okay, well, this app, I can do this, like maybe I can do 60% of what I originally intended. Well, then at that point, you then focus on the user experience and you design for that 60%, right? And, and hopefully what you present to the user is something that doesn't come across as being incomplete because you're only, you know, let's say you want to design a piece of software and have, you wanted six levels of functionality, but you only got four of them done. Well, then when you present the app, you present it with the four pieces of functionality, right? And you design it well so that it flows. And if it turns out that you even cut back because one of them pieces don't fit very well with what you have, then you should cut back never lose sight of the user experience, right? That's so critical. And, and uh, again, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you have experienced problems with software where it sounds really great. Wow, this should be really cool. It's gonna help me with this, this, and this. And then you start to use it and it's, it's confusing or it doesn't work properly or really think about that core user experience and, and as you design, the, as you implement the functionality of whatever you're making, whether it's a game or some you know, app, that you factor that in. Because a lot of people today, they, you know, they wanna be able to pick up that piece of software and start using it. They don't wanna have to read a manual. I, mean, I don't know if you ever read a manual. <laughs> I know I don't, but I hope that makes sense. So I see a question about the culture at DigiPen. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just be really brief about it. You know, at the end of the day, if we're talking about the game industry, I am, I can certainly tell you that for the most part, no company really, no game company really cares if you have a degree or not, right? I think what's important is that everybody understand that it's about competency. You know, if you're an artist, can you make good looking art? Can you animate? Can you design a you know, interface that's understandable, right? Um, if you're going to be a programmer, definitely you're gonna have to show your capabilities. And of course, as a designer, your ability to, uh, design experiences is really critical. So if you're looking to get into this kind of industry, what you need is a, 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 whatever educational experience you pursue needs to be something that's really focused on competencies, right? So at DigiPen, it's very competency-based, you know, even though it's a degree program, and even though the students are doing a lot of academic work, you can see that they're doing productions and, and, and development over and over and over again. So it is definitely a place that is, you know, pretty hardcore. I mean, those everyone who comes to uh, DigiJapan, uh, you know, we have a campus in the U.S., we have one in Spain, we have one in Singapore. All of these developers are, you know, they're part of a tribe, 
they're really committed um, and they're, you know, they're ready to sit down and, and work hard on it. So I think if you visited any of our campuses, even though they're different, you would feel that's a sort of a common thread to the culture that's there. So I don't think I see any more questions, but. Um... Yeah, and it, uh, Risha uh, left the Zoom for a moment. She probably has some technical issues. So if we don't have any more questions, I believe we can get back to getting the last few people into groups and you guys can get started before we have our uh, intro to Java event happening at, I believe it is, well, it is at, it is in just a few minutes or in a while. Okay, well that's About great. Well, I wish you guys all the best of luck and good luck with the hackathon, good luck with whatever you're going to make. Um, you know, I think it's, a, it's, it's always, again, a great opportunity to, you know, meet new people and, you know, face that challenge of how do, how do we rapidly prototype something that's actually pretty interesting. So um, I wish you good luck and I, I can't wait to see some of the results. Thank you so much for coming out. And thank, thank you very much for us. speaking. All right. My pleasure. Um, so on, on that note. We will send more details about the hackathon in announcements as uh, the speaker, uh, our our speaker is Risha. Uh, she has uh, currently some technical difficulties, but in the meantime, we invite you to begin hacking. Uh, does anyone have any questions? In which case, we can answer them right now. We will send more information regarding the prizes soon in Discord. Uh, we're currently still working with a few sponsors to figure out. So, depending on what happens with these sponsors. Uh, the prizes may change so that's why we don't want to you know, we'll up, we'll update you guys as soon as we have more information on uh, any other questions hi everyone i'm very very sorry about this as i said it's a very very happy hackathon um i am on a completely different device right now um so as Maria said, we'll send me, we'll be sending more details in the, in the Discord. Um, so be sure to watch the announcement channel for that. And I'm very sorry about this, but we will see you very soon. Happy hacking. Um, and make sure to join the first workshop at 2.40. Okay, bye guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I will remain here in case any of you have any questions, but thank you very much for joining the opening ceremony and we look forward to um, seeing you I have at a question. The, for the workshop. Yeah, go ahead. Where do you, um, when is like lesson, like the intro to Python and, and Java start? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but if you go to Discord and go to the events tab, it should be in the top of the, where the channels are. You should be able to see where all of the events and workshops are happening in your own time. So, right. so intro to Java is happening in an hour and ten minutes. Um, so, um, and then is there a link? Right. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to Discord at the top uh, of all the channels, you have fifteen events. Uh, okay, and if you scroll you. down, it'll tell you intro to Java, and the time is updated to your own time zone. So yeah. it'll tell you all of the events and et cetera. Uh, yeah, and that. while the event is happening, the event details will be on the very top of the, when you open our Discord server. Uh, so the link will be immediately accessible to you if the event is happening. If an event is happening at the moment, yeah. okay. there's Thank a description. You, so you can set a little, little reminder for yourself that'll I think ping you when it starts, and then there's a Zoom link as well. So yeah. Oh yeah, also Netta, I think just sent a schedule in chat that everyone can open. So yeah. I also wanted to ask a question, can I? Yeah, of course. In what form do we need to submit these projects? Like, do we need to have an app or a website or a presentation of our idea? So generally, everything is accepted, like as long as there's a project. But if you add a description or anything that will help the judges better understand your project, it will significantly boost your like, chances of doing better in the hackathon as the judges will better be able to understand your project and what you made. And that will allow them to better judge your project. But as long as there's something you submit, it's fine. Um, 
there's no requirements. You can be as creative as you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah. basically we can do a presentation in Canva, but we can just like put a pictures of how the software will look in the phone or in the desktop, right? Uh, yes, but it's significantly preferred if you also um, add a GitHub or your source code. Mm -hmm. So the judges can go through your code. And if you add a GitHub, that would be great because then we can see that you actually made the project during the hackathon or any way of being able to prove that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fine if you just have show pictures and uh, you can also just submit picture, pictures of your project and mm -hmm. add uh, no description. But I believe one of our mods just sent a, a thing in chat and yeah. like some options are a video yeah. demo presentation recording or a short paragraph description. And when you submit a project in DevPost, uh, DevPost will ask you a few questions about your project. So you'll, you'll have to fill out like a few questions giving you, giving the judges basic information about your project. But if you want to add any extra information, that's up to you and uh, you can do it in any way you want to. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? In that case, we will end. Uh, we will end the opening ceremony, and thank you very much for attending. Thank you. All right, guys. Good luck.